She is the type that just can't say no, that is always succumbing to other people's demands and expectations. And, and, and this woman fit the type, and she says, I can't stop doing it, I can't stop, I can't say no, I can't. Or maybe there's an emotional side that you haven't dealt with. Maybe there's some truth that you haven't yet glimpsed or known what to do with. Whenever you get triggered, somebody pulled that trigger, perhaps. But who's the one carrying the ammunition? How you handle the people who trigger you, that's your call. But at least know that you're the one with all the explosive inside you. And, and, and you gain so much liberation if you find out what, those, what that ammunition is and how you got it through getting to know yourself. And that's where freedom actually lies. If nobody had the power to trigger you, not because you were closed down and shut down and isolated, but because you're totally aware of yourself, well, that's where liberation actually is. The point of Compassion Inquiry is precisely to drill down to those core stories that people tell themselves. It's to actually get them to see what story they're telling themselves unconsciously, what those beliefs are, where they came from, and uh, show them, guide them to the possibility of letting go of those stories or letting go of the hold that those stories have on them. It's simply a method of drilling down. When I say drilling, I don't mean like a dentist. Although pain can come up, but the difference between this method and the dentist is that the dentist necessarily causes pain uh, in the course of their work and so most often uh, they numb people before they do their work. Well, here it's the opposite. It's not that we cause pain, but pain may emerge. And we don't want you to be numb. If the pain emerges, we want you to feel that pain. However, the assumption is that we don't have to cause it, it's already there. And very often the stories we tell ourselves are attempts to get away from the pain. I mean, I'm talking about the conscious stories, to get away from the pain or someone to manage it. And those efforts to manage the pain, not to feel it, then are the basic cause of illness. Whether physiological illness, uh, well, all illnesses are physiological, but whether the obviously identified illnesses like autoimmune disease, neurological illness, from multiple sclerosis to chronic skin conditions, these all have unresolved and unrecognized emotional underpinnings. And in my view, those underpinnings are rooted very strongly in a person's childhood. Not just in a sense of emotional dynamics and the stories we tell ourselves, but even very often in our very physiology. I gave it work, without which her life might be a lot more difficult, might be a lot less balanced. Nevertheless, she's still unable to utter the word no, despite 20 years of chanting. Well, that's spiritual bypass. That's why you do the spiritual work, and you might achieve, attain great states of even oneness, or peace, serenity, joy. And it may be true for you that it has really transformed your life, and it can even be true that it has transformed your life, but not in certain areas. And where the spiritual work has not transformed your life sufficiently, it could be for two reasons. Maybe you haven't practiced well or long enough, or maybe there's an emotional side that you haven't dealt with. Maybe there's some truth that you haven't yet glimpsed or known what to do with. And that's where the Compassion Inquiry complements the spiritual work. There will be at times when some heavy emotions may come up. When I say heavy emotions, I literally mean emotions that are hard to bear and, you know, hard to carry. That's okay. In fact, it's probably a sign of lack of depth on our part if that doesn't happen for some of you. Not that we intend to cause it, it's just that it, it's going to happen. So let's just talk about right now about what happens and how to manage it if that happens for you. So first of all, there's nothing wrong. If something, if you get triggered, that's the buzzword these days, that's perfectly all right. But on the other hand, for the person being triggered, you might want to consider what a trigger actually is. So the metaphor comes from what? It comes from weaponry. It comes from, you know, 
instruments of, of war. And the trigger actually is a very small part of the mechanism. The rifle or the pistol or the revolver, a machine gun, there's a whole mechanism to deliver the ammunition. There's the ammunition itself. There's something explosive that will propel the ammunition to its target. Then there's a trigger which is this big. Whenever you get triggered, somebody pulled that trigger, perhaps. But who's the one carrying the ammunition? Who's the one with the mechanism to deliver the ammunition? Who's the one with the explosive material inside them? And where do you want to put your attention? You want to put your attention on the trigger purely? Or are you curious about what ammunition, what explosive material you're carrying inside? So triggers are really great to work with if you want to get to know yourself. And if you don't want to get to know yourself, then what we usually do is we just resent whoever did the triggering and that we think they did this to us. How you handle the people who trigger you, that's your call. But at least know that you're the one with all the explosive inside you. And, and, and you gain so much liberation if you find out what, those, what that ammunition is and how you got it and whether you can really defuse it. Like the, you defuse a bomb, you can actually defuse that ammunition inside you through getting to know yourself. And that's where freedom actually lies. When, you, when nobody has, if nobody had the power to trigger you, not because you were closed down and shut down and isolated, but because you're totally aware of yourself. Well, that's where liberation actually is. And that's what all the spiritual teachers, I believe, want to educate people to do in that particular way. Uh, here we do it differently. Here we do what I would call the archaeology of the mind. You know, the archaeologist has got some very fine tools and they, they're very careful. You know, they don't just dig in there with a big shovel and you know, apply force. It's more like a very gentle dusting off of tiny little objects and looking, and looking at them what it's really about and seeing how they all fit together. And maybe what were broken fragments really are a beautiful vase. Uh, once the archaeologist has, has finished their work, and in this case, you're being invited to be your own, own archaeologist of the mind. Thank you for listening. I love you.